really exciting to be a geriatrician now because we're really dealing with more solutions to common problems that older adults have always had in ways that you just never would have imagined um, one or two decades ago. Uh, you know, when I finished in fellowship with, for geriatrics, um, there were things that were available for hearing loss, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there were hearing aids. There always have been hearing aids. Could everybody use them? Maybe. Lots of people tried and found them dissatisfying. Uh, you know, there's always been glasses to fix corrective, uh, to fix one's vision, to correct one's vision. But now there's laser surgeries that are actually curing cataracts for people. People are putting down their glasses. My own mother got rid of glasses after 60 years. Um, and even for things like dementia, where we still don't have um, therapeutics that are really great yet, sort of society is waking up to the fact that people with cognitive impairment can still play a meaningful role in their communities, can form meaningful relationships, can continue to learn and grow if we tailor our solutions to their problems to them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it used to always be about the search for magic drugs. And now it's really about how do you understand older adults? How do you sort of get into their shoes and figure out what kind of solutions that they need and then design around it? Um, you know, there are, there are glasses now that can sort of see around a cataract using cameras embedded in the glasses. There are um, devices that will help folks um, by reading the menu for them through a camera and then turning those words into spoken word and transmitting it into their ear. Wow. You know, I mean, there's just so much going on these days. Um, you know, when I think about falls and fall prevention, you know, we always used to have hip protectors, which nobody liked to wear. Um, they, you know, they sort of worked a little. They didn't really, they weren't really proven to work very well, but that's partly because nobody wore them. Um, and now you have um, uh, uh, devices that fit inside of a belt that deploy the way an airbag deploys in a car crash when it detects a sudden deceleration or a, a fall, a gravitational change. You know, you've got deployment of airbags and, you know, canes that do different things, scooters that do different things. It's really a great time to be in geriatrics and to figure out new ways to solve problems for older adults who really are just trying to live and enjoy their lives despite having multiple impairments. Um, you know, the, the burden of chronic disease in older adults and what we call geriatric syndromes, hearing loss, vision loss, cognition difficulty, functional difficulty, falls, too many medications, you know, despite having those problems. And listen, a lot of people have those problems. We are gonna have those problems as we get older. Um, the idea that there's so much energy into finding solutions for them, that's sort of what I think about all day long. Uh, it's been great to be part of the Eversound journey a little bit. Happy to talk about that and uh, talk more about uh, aging and hearing loss as much as you like. Yeah, and actually the the thing that piqued my interest uh, around the the research that you've been doing, recently you wrote an article on uh, a new type of dementia called late. Can you uh, tell us a bit about what that is and how it differs from other types of dementia? Uh, sure, so late is a variant of a very Alzheimer's-like dementia. So if you think about all the people who have Alzheimer's disease today, which accounts for about 60, 65, 70% of all the dementias, whether it occurs alone or together with something else, pick off 20, 30% of that, it's probably this other entity called late. Okay. And um, there's no diagnostic tool for it today. There's no blood test or lab test that you can go and find out that you have late instead of Alzheimer's. In fact, most physicians these days won't really even necessarily know about late in any meaningful way in the clinic with their patients. Right. Um, but essentially, uh, scientists and clinicians have been looking at brain tissue from people who have died who had dementia. And when they looked at all those people under the microscope, people who donated their bodies to science or donated their brains to science after their death, what they realize is that all these people who had Alzheimer's-like disease, which all of us would have labeled as Alzheimer's, it certainly behaved like Alzheimer's, it progressed like Alzheimer's, they think. When they looked at it under the microscope, it was something a little bit different. It was unique. And 
it stands for a bunch of things, but it, it's in a slightly different distribution in the brain. Um, it has a different protein that's globbed together, different from Alzheimer's. In Alzheimer's, we think about things called plaques and tangles. This thing is just different. Um, and eventually they figured out that enough people have these different changes in the brain that this is really a distinct entity. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is Alzheimer's like, right. shares a lot of the same characteristics, tons of overlap. Some people have probably both changes that are Alzheimer's and changes that are late, um, but it's distinct. Um, and that's really uh, exciting news because so much of our um, drug development and drug testing and clinical trials for medications that can stop Alzheimer's have really not been successful. And it's possible that one of the reasons for that is that a bunch of the people actually didn't have Alzheimer's. Um, so this gives us a whole new direction to go in. It gives us a new protein to target through drug development. So it's, um, it's exciting, but it's really early innings. People ask me questions about this all the time. It's we're really, really early innings. You know, your physician is not gonna tell you you don't have Alzheimer's, you have late. Nobody should expect that to happen at home. Right. Um, no one's, uh, there's no test that can differentiate between them. So the scientific community is learning, the physicians are learning, the patients are learning, and hopefully over the next five to 10 years, maybe this is a new direction that might actually produce drugs that can stop dementia. That would really be fantastic. Um, so that's the story with late. Yeah, do you see it um, helping kind of in that differentiation? Do you see it helping us with, with treatment? And is there something that uh, we know about the those globs uh, that form in, in late? that we can see, okay, we can probably solve it this way. Uh, still early innings for that. Right, yeah. Early innings. We know the name of the protein. We know that it's distinct from the proteins that cause the plaques and the tangles in Alzheimer's. Um, so all the labs are ramp ramping up their, their testing. Right. Um, there'll certainly be a lot more opportunity for people to try to um, uh, sort of volunteer themselves and, and document the course of their disease because we're still trying to pick it apart a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, looks like Alzheimer's, um, when alone, goes slow. When late is alone, it goes slow. When they're together, it might go faster. Lots of people in the community are used to hearing about some people who get diagnosed and pass away quickly mm. within two, three, four years, and other people who get, are diagnosed with what looks like Alzheimer's and are alive for a decade or more. It could be that some had one, some had the other, some had both. So, so there's an opportunity to sort of try to figure that out and document how people progress and maybe separate the populations a little bit. Also an opportunity to perhaps design clinical trials a little bit better to try to really separate those populations, but um, it's really early innings. It's, uh, it, right. The hope is absolutely. Yeah. If, if, if targeting beta amyloid didn't work, maybe targeting TDP43, this other protein, right. can work. So that's pretty exciting. If you're a basic researcher working on Alzheimer's disease, that's great news to have new targets. Yeah. And do you see this affecting the caretakers at this point of like this uh, this new finding? Not really. No. No, it's too it's still too early. Too okay. too early to make a difference in I think people's daily lives. Okay. So the the CDC had posted that in the next 30 years they expect the uh, the number of people living with dementia to triple yes. uh, to something around 14 million yes. uh, in the United States. Um, what are the senior living communities currently doing? Um, and do you think that's, do you think we're prepared for that kind of build? I think, you know, there's sort of, I always think of things as sort of in two tracks. I'm what I like to call a, 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 a optimistic pessimist. Mm -hmm. So I like to think of both sides of the coin a little bit. There's no question that we are on the verge of just a greater acceptance of dementia in our communities. Okay. There are cities, towns, municipalities, um, public systems and organizations that are taking a whole new look at how they can support families with dementia and their caregivers whether that's programs in the local library, whether that's uh, dementia-friendly rehabilitation programs, whether that's hiking and dancing and swimming 
just this idea that more and more people are gonna have memory impairment and they still need to get out and do things in the community. And so the community is changing itself. And in all fairness, dementia is being transferred, in my mind, from sort of the post-World War, from the World War II generation to the boomers. And the boomers are saying, I'm not ready to pack it in just because you give me a diagnosis of dementia. I'm not gonna sit home and wait for it all to happen. I'm gonna get out there and still do what I was doing yesterday and you need to accommodate that. And you know, the boomer generation is used to telling society that they need to accommodate, and I'm all for it. I think that is exactly the right uh, approach. Um, and there's a lot to learn, both from people with dementia and for people with dementia. So, so I'm very optimistic about that. I think society writ large is more accepting of this diagnosis than it used to be, and ready to support the people with it and their caregivers more than ever before. So that's the good news. That's, that, that's sort of the, I view that all that as positive. Um, when I think about the work the Alzheimer's Association is doing, Dementia Friendly America, uh, when I think about um, grants that are going out to municipalities, the work done by the area agencies on aging across the country, I mean, this is great stuff. Having said that, the numbers don't lie. Um, there are more and more people with dementia who are gonna be upon us as the boomers age. Um, a lot of the boomers are in their 70s now. That's when the symptoms are starting to appear, perhaps very mild at first. Um, more and more people in today's world live alone than ever before. The rate of uh, unmarried persons today in older, uh, uh, older ages is higher than ever before. Families are living farther and farther apart than they used to. Um, it's a tough one. I mean, the reality is uh, people eventually need care. They need assistance. Maybe care is the wrong word. People need assistance as dementia can progresses. And it's hard to know if everyone's gonna be around to provide that care. We're very used to in past generations, the doting husband, wife, or daughter, sometimes the son, being generally the person who just does it. And it's unclear whether um, everybody's ready for that and whether everybody's around. For that, I mean, my mother lives in San Francisco. I live in Kentucky. My wife's family all lives in New York. Um, people live across the globe. Um, and so th those are challenges. That's a big challenge. Um, the caregiver challenge, writ large, is a big problem. And the second problem that goes along with that, as everybody who's watching knows, is that um, not all of that will be free. And um, are people ready to absorb the cost of caregiving? both to perhaps acquire the caregiver services, but for the caregivers themselves, they give up enormous cost, um, opportunity cost. You know, the, the number of lost, uh, the amount of lost productivity provided by caregivers in America today is in the billions, if not trillions. Um, people don't work, they don't take on extra work. Um, so it's just a big question. The whole financing of all of this is a big question. When you start to think about um, assisted living, um, in-home uh, aids and attendant care, skilled nursing care, um, you know this this is uh, this is not cheap. So and I know that's on a lot of people's minds. So I think those are the that, that's the that's the other side of the coin.